Yeah, that's good. We'll make sure this mic's in the right place. Sure. Is that okay? Can you hear me? Oops, I'm a little short here. Um, I'd like to, uh, to thank Jesse and James for curating the uh, Narrow Gym, uh, Chimney Reading Series. And thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, I think that in this day and age, it seems to me that poetry is needed more than ever. As the great poet William Carlos Williams wrote, it is difficult to get the news from poems, yet men die miserably every day for lack of what is found there. I'd like to begin with just a few poems from my new book, which speaks to some of that. I have been thinking a lot about my reaction and my responsibility to all the cynicism and violence that I'm witnessing in our world. And so the short list of certainties uh, explores all the ways in which we're blind. Um, it opens with a prologue poem, Snowblind, which kind of sets the stage for this spiritual voyage. Uh, it's akin to Pilgrim's Progress. That is if the travelers were two modern feminist spirits who continually materialize and dematerialize through time, physical space, and social boundaries. Um, these twin daughters of hope, courage, and anger uh, struggle with themselves and argue with each other, and they rage at the world as they find it and even fight with hope itself. Um, I'm pleased to say that, the, that I just found out this out last week that it did win, and I'll, I'll pronounce, it, pronounce it hopefully okay. Um, it's the Jacopone <laughs> da Tode book series prize from Franciscan um, Press. It's, it, yeah, thank you. It's um, the, the, um, the prize is named after a 13th century mystic, which somehow I'm kind of maybe put him into the next book. Okay. Uh, the first poem is called Snowblind. Perhaps it was the weight of snow falling on the ground year after year, or the crying winds cutting a ravine to the water which caused the glacier to quake and urged the cold light to reflect off that sorrow and temporarily blind me. Just so, in that moment I could hear for once the pure sound of the groaning earth tearing itself apart. And when I could open my eyes again without pain, there were halos everywhere, around the sun, on the wind, and then something unnamed and unknowable from another world descended and before long drifted towards me on the open Arctic sea. Whatever it was, it was holy. The way the frozen world made a home for it, as if before dropping into this bitter stillness, it touched the face of God and being Stunned, numb, was astonished to find itself waking inside a rage of blue ice. Its long, slow howl calling the ground to quiver and snap. So, thank you. That's nice. So we're on this journey. Um, the personas in the poem are these two sisters, as I said, hope and anger. Um, and this is a long title. When moving from point A to point B, do not intrude on that empty space of not having to be anywhere at all. But tonight, I'm scared to be this much alone. I know I shouldn't turn to the man sitting next to me, the one slumped, in his train car seat. It's been raining all day. There have been many delays. He's exhausted. My muddy shoes make popping noises as I step on bags of potato chips and 
double espresso cups scattered on the floor next to our feet. When the conductor takes the ticket from our pockets, moves on, I touch the man's sleeve, press my fingers into his arm. The lines on his face deepen as I talk about how New York City will eventually crumble and fall into the sea. And my crazy uncle who screams until his face bursts like a balloon being bitten by a dog. I talk of war and its dead children, about time and its heavy hand on my neck. I tell him the story of how I drove into our parked car and left and came back, then left again. I said, I should quit smoking and I will quit smoking, but can't quit smoking, at least not today. And I'd like to know if he knows, I say, if it's at all possible for anyone to slip into the holy nothingness of now. Finally, when I pause to take a breath, the man pushes the brim of his fedora hat over his eyes as the train shush shushes over the tracks. I look out the train car window, which frames a full moon and rattles on like teeth chattering in a skull. The winter sky is clear now and full of stars. The Big Dipper points somewhere I just might have to go. So, so this is like a movie trailer. Those are the first two poems, and now this is the second section. And these are the two daughters that I spoke of before. And it's called Two Daughters. Like a divining rod, my pickup rolls, my pickup pulls me towards you taking the back road, winding around mountains, down to the valley, past to where the sheep bridge once stood, high above the old mining camp in pine tree forest. Then the truck stalls. Near pallets of abandoned brick and stone dry wells, I kick the dust from the, with the tip of my boot, boot just to see the birds scatter and fly through broken windows of empty houses. Standing in the street, I'm waving my arms in circles, shouting good and loud as if my need alone is enough to make ghosts leave the peace of their graves. Finally, I find you sitting in a patch of brown grass in front of a stranger's home, hypnotized by the wind groaning through the wood walls and moss growing up the porch stairs. Your lips move but nothing gets said. There's a tapping on at the top of the tin roof. Something kind and beautiful has come for us. But I won't look. Lighting yet one more cigarette, a smoke ring drifts out my mouth, disappears in the air. Remembering now all the times I refused to eat, enjoying the dizziness of my own hung hunger. How emptiness is the white room with no doors, no window, no sound. And me, shoulders pressed against the black back wall with fists upright and ready to fight. As evening approaches, fireflies burst into luminescence. Miles and miles away, a train whistle blows twice. I inhale deeply. My cigarette glows red. A hummingbird flies nervously above your head. I turn my face to the west and wait. The sky, now a holocaust of light, calls out. Burn a path through this world or move on to the next. You can tell I used to be a smoker. <laughs> it's been 20 years, but I still like a cigarette. Um, okay, so this is the signature poem and the last poem in the book. So the first two, middle, and the end. The short list of certainties. Let us remember the taste of salt on the tongue, 
the way snakes move through the open reaches of Iron Mountain. Can't you picture the young mother standing in the doorway of a house made sad by too much sadness, not enough work? And when you are offered the smell of creosote after a rain, the whir of strange voices on the city street, a pearl moon, do not calculate the cost. Let us at last, or at least, bless the empty desert as if it were a blank page. Then, having courage, let us write a word or a phrase on the short list of certainties, something that sounds very much like praise. So that's the end of the book. Thank you. <laughs> the next two poems come from a manuscript I'm working on that I just didn't intend to write at all. Um, it's uh, in the voice of body, so it's the, but it's not one body. It's the, the body speaks to us, right? I don't know about you, but my body speaks to me all the time. Um, and so I thought it would be interesting to write a, a book about body as subject and body as um, object. Um, this next poem is, uh, I think, self-explanatory. <clears throat> it's called Body's Prison Tattoo. The needle wriggles up and down like a worm caught between the beak of a bird. Blood mixes with forget-me-not blues, purple rivulets of desire filling the belly of swallows, one once thought to carry the souls of sailors to heaven. Now these wings on the back of body's hands, part bone, part feather, pull inward. This ain't no lie. These fists can fly. Thank you. The chal I'm in the middle of writing this this thing that kind of came to me. So the challenge for the body poems is to write each poem without uh, any reference to gender. Um, this poem actually just came out this week, this next one. And it's a poem about um, the consequences of suffering tr trauma. And it's called, For the Last Time, Body Explains Dissociation. There's a bloody handprint on the front door of an old farmhouse. Snow drifts into the parlor, empty now except for an ant clinging to a red balloon which rises above the floor, floats over the hair sofa and the crooked tops of picture frames, finally resting in the ceiling corner like a child's head in the crook of a parent's arm. Winter's eye is closing. All the windows are painted black a candle sizzles, sizzles into its own wax. The staircase groans. Of course it would. If there is any wonder, it's the mice eating through the kitchen pipes. A plane soars overhead, cuts a hole in the roof. Suddenly, there's a turning, and it's not the iron key inside the metal lock, but the dead dressed in long silk shirts emerging from velvet flocked walls. Soon the clock will, will swallow its cuckoo and the bird ghost will cluck and coo. It's not the leaving that hurts so much, but the passing through. Thanks. The last two poems I'm going to read to you are from another manuscript I also didn't intend to write. Um, and I have to tell you, I really don't know what it's about. Except um, I've been doing research into Ariz, you know, like going to Ariz, like looking at the desert and really trying to look. And there's so much in this state that um, has kind of adopted me. Um, that is winding up into this manuscript. And this is called Divinations. Um, it, I actually was thinking about the setting for this uh, 
uh, down in Tucson, the, the Dove of the Desert. Do you know that church down there? Anyway. Okay, it's called Divinations. I'm not dead yet, you say. Good, I say. Now hold on to my arm, I say. Steady yourself. As we begin to make our way up the dirt trail towards Grotto Hill, I see in the distance stone lions waiting at the gate, jaws open in perpetual roar. Don't worry so much, you say. It's my job, I say. Now, we're halfway up the mountain, having just left the old mission church known as the place where water appears. And I tell you, I believe in divination, the way a drowsers grasp the Y-shaped branch with the palm of both hands and walk slowly over the ground until the rod dips, then dives deep into the earth. And there, leaping from the dusty barren sand, water overflows and the desert is made green once again. But then we make our turn and there in the middle of the desert is the grotto where on a makeshift table of slab rock, two dozen candles flicker and tucked under each candle, cards, letters, tattered photographs, prayers for we, we two will never know. You scribble on a slip of paper fold the note in half and then half again, the corners forming a small envelope into which you leave just one name. You hold your breath tight inside your chest and I'm so afraid of what will happen when you have to let it go. Thank you. And I'll end with this poem, which I think is apropos for the way I've been feeling lately and most of my life. On my tombstone, it will say, she was so confused. <laughs> no doubt. Sleepwalking through the city. Often I find myself waking in strange places, in a neighbor's bathtub, at the pauper cemetery, on the last car of the light rail. The doc said it comes from watching too much news. The fragile mind can't cope. Tonight, here I am again, alone and confused, standing barefoot in the heart of Phoenix at the Zen Garden, row, hole, on. It's late. There's black tar on the bottoms of my feet. I must have been walking for hours with eyes wide open, seeing nothing but this unraveling dream tucked somewhere in between Central and Third Ave. The night took me to the Golden Buddha, squatting on a slab of rose quartz, stort, rose quartz stone. He winks and grins at me. Nothing is lost in the universe. Suddenly, Everything I thought I ever knew is rushing at me. It's not the first time I've been taken for a fool. My throat is dry, sweat runs down my back. I decide to ignore him, focus on how I've always loved the hidden places of the city, named for a bird which consumes itself in flames, then rising from its own ashes is born just to do it all over again. Thank you so much. <laughs>